Today in this final message uh, in this series, uh, we'll start a brand new series next Sunday, I want to make sure that, that we understand, that we get, have faith and an eagerness to receive everything God has for us. There's an area that I believe is one of the greatest gifts in your personal devotion, your personal prayer time, your personal spiritual growth, that the church at large, in fact, well, let me say, the Western church, the American church, has almost stopped teaching. There's an area that will bless you and encourage you. It will help you pray when you don't know how to pray. It will encourage you and build your faith. And we've almost, you, you, you rarely ever hear teaching on this anymore. So I don't want to rob you of this gift. I don't want to, uh, uh, for you to miss something that is a gift to everyone that God wants to give us. So today, we're going to examine this narrative in Acts chapter 2 and throughout the book of Acts, and we're going to see something that was very common in the early church, something that was standard operating procedure, something that was first questions they would ask a new gathering of believers, and that was about praying in tongues, praying in an unknown language. It seems like we, we've shied away from that in the church. It seems like it's an area that people have stopped teaching, and so because of that, people don't understand, people don't know what it means, there's misconceptions. Well, today, let's look at some clear biblical truth. Let's go in and look at some clear biblical principles and, and see what God has for us. Again, my prayer is that we will have faith, that we'll have hunger, that we'll recognize, wow, this is a gift. That will enlarge my spiritual journey. It's not a badge of honor. Praying in unknown tongues is not restricted to a few people. It wasn't restricted a centuries ago. Doesn't necessarily mean one person's more spiritual than another. It's just a gift that God has for us. We want to delve into this today. And I believe it's going to be a great encouragement to your life. I, I want us to see how did we move from something common and normal to something almost neglected in the church today. So let's look at that. Let's, let's take a look at what happened as Jesus promised to this church as it began and, and became a part of their daily journey. So let's go to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. I want you to follow with me. We're going to read through the majority of this chapter, and, and we'll see what's happening here. Remember, Jesus said uh, in Acts 1, don't leave Jerusalem. I've given you an assignment to preach a gospel to the world. You're, I'm going to use you greatly. I'm going to confirm my word, but you need to be empowered. If we're going to be miracle delivery agents, we need to be empowered. Can somebody say amen to that? If we're going to live this gospel out and be witnesses of Jesus. So let's read this. What happened on the day the church was launched when the promise Jesus gave began to be fulfilled, let's read about this. Acts 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So what happened here? As they were gathered together that day and praying, God said, Jesus had said, stay and wait for the promise of the Father. What happened? Three things happened in the room that day uh, that were visible, that were physical, that were observable. Three manifestations as they were baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. There was tongue, tongues of fire, there was wind, and they prayed in tongues. We're going to see as we go forward uh, in the book of Acts and the history of the church's beginning, fire did not continue to appear over the church and wind did not continue every time, but they began to pray in tongues and that became a common experience in the early church. In this initial time, there were three manifestations, obvious pictures of the Holy Spirit, fire, Fire, like the burning bush that Moses saw. Fire that fell in Solomon's temple. The glow of the Shekinah presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Fire is a powerful symbol of the Holy Spirit. Fire. Wind. Wind is a powerful uh, illustration of the Holy Spirit. Even the breath of God, how he breathed into Adam. This was God breathing into this body of Christ. And they came alive. But tongues continue to be the pattern. And the principle that we saw going through the book of Acts. Well, what happened when they did this? Let's look in verse 5. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Again, in the wisdom and prophetic knowledge of God, this occurred on the day of Pentecost. 
one of the three feasts where all the men of Israel were gathered in that city. One of the feasts where religious Jews from around the world had gathered. And on that day, God brought the world to Jerusalem to witness the power of the Holy Spirit, to launch the church for every nation. What happens? They came from every place, verse 6. When they heard this sound of the church worshiping in these unknown tongues, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. So what happened? See, the church, we've almost been, uh, we almost indoctrinated to think that we need to be careful about the gifts and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That what if someone who who's, you know, doesn't understand is around and we're worshiping in tongues, we're, we're doing what the early church did. Well, the Bible says it didn't repel a crowd, it brought a crowd. The, the nations gathered and said, hey, what's going on? And I want you to see this. What did they say? We're amazed because we know these men and women praying are local Galileans. And yet they are worshiping God in the languages we can understand. And that's really the definition of praying in an unknown tongue. It is the Holy Spirit's enablement to pray in a language that you did not learn naturally. Most of the time, it's heavenly languages, unknown languages. But as a sign to those gathered, these Galileans were praying in unknown tongues. What happens when you're praying in tongues? I've heard people say, well, it's just emotion. It's just ecstatic utterances. It's not really, you know, something important. But what was happening? Here, Scripture says, what did they hear them saying as they're praying in tongues? Was it just gibberish or emotion? No, it was articulate it was powerful. It honored God. What were they saying? In verse 11, look with me. We hear them declaring the wonders of God. It was a language. It was inspired by God. It was powerful. It drew the attention of the unbeliever. It was a sign that God was in their midst. They were honoring God as the Holy Spirit enabled them. So how did the people respond? This is very common. Look at verse 12. Some were amazed. Some were perplexed. They said, what in the world is going on here? In our religious experience, we've never seen anything like this. We, we're amazed. We know they're not doing it in their own ability, but we don't understand how. And then there was another reaction. Look, still, uh, uh, they were perplexed. What does this mean? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, I just had too much wine. So what happens when people encounter the presence of God? Some people say, wow, I, I don't know what this is, but I know it's God. Some people say, I, I don't understand what it is. Help me understand. And some people just dismiss it and say, ah, there's nothing to that. Those folks just been drinking all night. They're just drunk this morning. That's all that is. But when they wanted to know what was going on, let, let, let's look at Peter's response. Verse 14, what did Peter do? He did what I'm doing today. He did what everything God does can always be verified. He went straight to Scripture. When they said, I'm amazed. When they said, I don't understand. When someone was skeptical, what do we do? We go to the Word of God. Can somebody say amen to that? So Peter goes to, he, he begins to quote Joel. And he says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. Can, can I say something Evidently, and, and let's, let's be real about this, evidently these men and women who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and praying in an unknown tongue, it, it, was, it was a powerful experience. It touched them. It, you know, there have been times, let's be honest, if you've ever been in a Pentecostal charismatic church, there, there are times people may get carried away a little bit. Let's don't act all funny. We're being real today. There have been some people that let their emotions get ahead of the Holy Spirit. There have been some people, but you know what? You know, and I, but I, have, I kind of struggle. We want everything to be in order. But I don't know what's more out of order, dead 
or too much light? I mean, come on, let's tell the truth. I've been to church where it's dead. I mean, I didn't know, is this a funeral or a church service? Did everybody die or just one person die? Come on, tell the truth. I don't know that being petrified is more holy than might be getting a little too excited about it. I've always felt as a pastor, I, it's easier to calm down somebody a little too excited than raise the dead every Sunday. Come on, don't shout me down. So, so there was a reaction. Let's don't be afraid of that. There was a reaction. There was something about this. In fact, most people today, and we can't, let's don't get carried away with this, most people today, if they think somebody's drinking and having a party, they're associated with having fun and a good time. See, the only thing they could compare it to, these people are having a party. These people are in it. These people are going for it. You know what I'm saying? These people are lit. You know, something's going on here. You know, we don't know why, what happened. We don't know what they're drinking, but they got something going on. Well, there's power. There's joy. See, what happened? The church has lost its joy. <laughs> and somebody begins to worship with joy, exuberance, thankfulness, gratitude. The religious mind says, oh, I just forget that. Okay. But Peter says, that's not what's going on here. He says, what you're seeing, let's look. He begins to quote verse 17, or verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Thank God. On all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Peter says this is what God said he would do. This is what launches the last day. Somebody asked me recently, a lot of people have during the corona uh, uh, virus pandemic, Pastor, is this the end time? Buddy, we've been in the end times 2,000 years. We're in the end of the end times. How many hear what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, right, so you, if somebody says, is this the end times? Tell them yes. Then you can give an altar call right there. That'll scare them. Most of the non-believers, I tell them, if they tell me, Pastor, is this the end time? I say, yeah, it is. It's the end time. I got their attention right there because you're telling the truth, right? Don't, don't back up. Be afraid. Well, no one knows. Yeah, we know. It's been 2,000 years we've been in the end time. So the next time your Uncle Harry comes at that family reunion and says, well, is this the end time? Say, Uncle Harry, it's the end of the end time. You want to go over here in the bedroom and pray? Well, you'd be good, right, Uncle Harry. It's the end of the end time. So he says, that's where we are, and I'm going to pour out my spirit. So, 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 you know, then what happens? Peter begins to preach. Remember Peter? The last time we read about him, he's denying Jesus. He's gone back to fishing. He's given up on the apostolic call on his life. But he makes it to the upper room. He's baptized in the Holy Spirit. He receives an anointing, the restoration of his call, and he stands up and begins to preach. This anointed message, you see the immediate difference. Let's drop down to verse 36. Let me go forward a little bit. What happens now? Stay with me here. We're seeing what happens now when he gives us, when he's preaching. Look, look at his preaching. Man, I love the boldness. Therefore, verse 36, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You know, we, without the power of the Holy Spirit, we lose the boldness of preaching and teaching in our generation. How many, give me, how, let me say it on this side of the church. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we lose the boldness to preach the truth of God right now. We need some truth being preached in this generation at this time. Right now, they, they, they say, you know, don't, don't, don't offend anybody. Don't make anybody nervous. Don't say, Peter stands up and said, you killed him. You crucified him. Huh? But the good news is it's not too late to do something about it. So he's preaching. They, these people are listening. He says, you crucified him, but he, God made him Lord of Christ. Let's go on, verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? How many remember the day you got saved? I remember the day I got saved. Can I tell you something? Were you comfortable and happy and slappy the day you got saved or under conviction? I was under conviction. I didn't get saved because I was happy. I got saved because I was convicted. Come on, somebody tell the truth. I mean, I was under conviction. And these people were cut to the heart. They said, my God, that's truth. Dear God, that's truth. I understand truth. What am I supposed to do? What do I need to do? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, and then what happens? And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is important because this gift, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, the manifestation that accompanies it of praying in an unknown tongue, it, was that just for them? Did it just die then? Well, let's look. What does he say? He says, he, he gives the time frame. The promise is for you, those that were there that day. And then he continues and he says, who? It's for your children. Now, you know that some of the children of those that heard him that day outlived those apostles. Those apostles were grown men. Their children, the children of that next generation outlived them. He says, so it's not just for now. It's for your children. Then he doesn't stop. Then he says, it's for all who are far off by distance and by time. And then he says to make it sure for all whom the Lord our God will call. As long as people are coming to Jesus, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful Powerful gift. So let's keep reading what happened. So look at verse 40. With many of the words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. What a beginning for the church. Can somebody say amen to that? Here's Peter denying, waffling, fearing, running, Powered by the Holy Spirit, he steps into his calling, is incredibly effective. Let me say something to you. Not everyone is called to preach. Not everyone's called to pastor. Not everyone is an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. But all of us are miracle delivery agents. All of us have a gifting and a calling and an assignment. Your assignment is where you work. Your assignment is in your home. Your assignment is in your school. And the good news is this Peter that blew it and blew it and blew it as the Holy Spirit enabled him, he stepped into his assignment and was powerful and fruitful. Sir, you can be a godly husband. You can be a godly father. Ma'am, you can be a godly mother. You can be a godly wife. We can be godly people in the marketplace, in our schools, godly students. Why? Because it's not by our power. It's not by our strength. It's by the Spirit of Almighty God. Hey, I'm going to tell you, I spent three and a half hours yesterday working with Phoenix on one math lesson online. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to teach your children how to virtually go to school in the coronavirus pandemic. Come on, somebody give me an amen. In fact, that was the second lesson I taught her. So before we started yesterday, I said, Phoenix, come here and sit down and take my hand. Lord, anoint us, help us, strengthen us. I don't know who developed Common Core, but they didn't have common sense. That's my, I can tell you that. Whoever wrote Common Core did not have common sense. I need to get back on my preaching, but I, there, there was a problem. It, it asked a question. I answered in 1.2 seconds. It took me 15 minutes to write it out the way they wanted to. Now tell me how that's common sense. I looked at it. I said, well, Phoenix answers this. And then here's, but you got to go here and here and here and here and here and here and here. Go to the next screen, here and here. And guess what we got 15 minutes later? The same thing I said 15 minutes ago. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit <laughs> to do homework. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to act right while I'm helping my granddaughter. Do crazy core. I meant common core math in this day and time. I'm George Sawyer, and I approve this political statement if you don't. <laughs> Let's get back to business here. <laughs> Jesus, help us. Aren't you thankful that the power of the Holy Spirit is not just for a Sunday morning or an apostle or a missionary? It's for every one of us. And God equips us and enables us and strengthens us to do what he called us to do in this season and to do it well. I, I want you to see something. So we see here. I want to keep moving us through this narrative. We see Acts chapter 2 and this powerful launching of the church. As I told you a moment ago, three manifestations on that initial day, fire, wind, and tongues. But what are the patterns? 
What are the principles that continue throughout this? Go to Acts chapter 10 and verse number 44 with me. Acts 10, 44. Let's see, does this continue? Was it a one-time experience? Was it just for the beginning? Here we are in Cornelius' household, the first non-Jew, the first Gentiles to be saved. Peter had to go through a whole encounter with the Holy Spirit and two different visions to get over his prejudice and go preach to a Gentile. Can somebody hear what I'm saying? Maybe what we need to get through the racial problems in America today is a fresh vision of God that will get me over my prejudice and deal with my insecurities and connect me with people who aren't like me. Maybe we will finally run out of all of our efforts and get back to the the original answer it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that God will help us be who we're supposed to be he's preaching Acts 10 44 look at this while Peter was still speaking these words I love that he hadn't even gotten to the altar call and this time nobody was even laying hands on anybody any with me see they're listening <laughs> What's happening? They're hearing the word, and the word's releasing faith. Are you with me? While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Do you notice in every one of these situations where there's a group of people, everyone receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Everyone receives it. It's not just for a few. They all begin to pray in this heavenly language. Watch this. All, they still speak, and the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers are the Jews who had become believers. Watch this. Who had come with Peter, look at this, were astonished that the, the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even Gentiles. Lord have mercy. Do you know you can be saved and born again and got to deal with some issues in your life? How many heard what I just said? These circumcised believers were stunned that God would save a Jew, would save a non-Jew, a Gentile. And what convinced them? What convinced them of? Listen, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked Peter to stay. See, they weren't even going to baptize them in water. These Jewish believers said, I don't know if a Gentile can really be saved. We, we, we're going to come, but we don't want to be here. We're not sure it is going to work. We've never been in a Gentile's house. It's kind of weird in here. Let's don't get excited. Let's don't start baptizing people. We don't know. God says, would you get out of the way, please? I'm just going to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to fill them with the Holy Spirit. They're going to begin to speak in tongues. And they looked at each other and said, what are we going to do? <laughs> They're praying in tongues just like we did. Peter said, are you ready to baptize them in water now? He said, okay, let's go do it. Let's go to Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. See, I want you to see this pattern. What are the patterns? What are the principles? What continue? Here we are 20 years after Acts chapter 2. Paul's on his third missionary journey. 20 years later, we're in, we're in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some whom? Some disciples that already accepted Christ as their Savior. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Aren't you thankful that God looks at our heart? Aren't you thankful that people that don't know all the verbiage and don't have their PhDs and don't have the theology, when they just say, Jesus, save me, he says, okay. Aren't you thankful that you don't have to have it all figured out, just a heart that says, I want to be saved. He says, you're ready, let's go. They said, we didn't know what came along with this. So he says to them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then watch. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Do you see the pattern? It just continues and continues and continues. In fact, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Praying in tongues enabled by the Holy Spirit, was so common in the early church, listen to me, that Paul had to give them guidelines. He said, you guys need to understand that praying in tongues at home is not like praying in tongues at church. 
He said, you guys are praying in tongues so much we can't have church. He had to give guidelines. It wasn't uncommon. It was common. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Are you ready? Look at this. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now, that's the apostle Paul. He says, I speak in tongues more than everybody. What was he saying? Look at the next verse, though. Verse 19. He says, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Their tongues were so prevalent, he had to teach them on the difference in praying in their prayer language in their private prayer time and what you do when you come to church. He says, at church, I don't come and just pray in tongues. I preach and teach. He says, praying in tongues is more for your private prayer time unless that gift operates when God has a message and there's an interpretation to that tongue. So tongues are very fluent, and he teaches them how to operate. But when he sums up the teaching, I want you to go to, uh, as we look at this, let's go to verse 39. As he sums up his teaching to that church in Corinth, this is what he says. Look at this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, are you with me? Verse 39, chapter 14, be eager to prophesy and what? Do not forbid speaking in tongues. Go to verse 40. But everything should be done a fitting and orderly way. So what he had, this was so prevalent. This was so fluent. It was such a part of the fabric of the New Testament church that Paul the apostle said, I'm praying in tongues more than all of you. said, let's follow the guidelines for public gatherings and for praying in your private time. It's amazing. So let's, let, let's look at this. If, if praying in tongues was so normal, so prevalent, what happened to us? We, we've neglected it. We've not taught on it. We've resisted it. So people aren't aware of the gift. Just like in Ephesus, we've stopped asking believers, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Do you know what God has for you? Do you know this experience? We, the church has quit asking, so people have quit receiving. The church has quit teaching, so people have stopped knowing. How many hear what I said? Do you know what you'll get? You'll get what you preach. If you preach about healing, people get healed. If you preach about salvation, people get saved. If you preach about deliverance, people get delivered. If you put the word out, people hear the word. Faith comes and they receive it. And so what I'm doing to do for you today, because I love you, because I love the word, I don't want you to miss one thing God has for you. I don't want you to have one thing that God would do in your life that you might miss out on. So if this was so prevalent, what was the good of this? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Let's go to chapter 14, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 14 and 15. Are you ready? I want you to read this. This is very important. We use the term in the New Testament, praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. What does that mean? Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. You got that? It's here for you. Watch. At home, make sure you get this, okay? For if I pray in a what? In a, let me hear you, in a, what's happening? My, so what's happening when you're praying in tongues? Your spirit's praying. What does that mean? But my mind is unfruitful. So what does that mean? Listen to me. Praying in tongues is not a mental exercise. It's a spiritual exercise. Are you with me? Praying in tongues, here's the good news. It is, is, watch this. It's when we begin to pray beyond our mental capacity. Praying in tongues is not inferior to intellectual things. It's superior to intellectual things. I think that's what challenges the church today is that we encounter something that says to us, God knows more than you know. God has something that's above all you can do. And we begin to see that as you pray in tongues, you're praying beyond the capacity of your mind. It didn't originate in your mind. That's what that means. It's not a prayer you framed. It's a prayer God framed that came through your spirit. Look at the next verse, verse 15. He says, so what am I going to do? So what should I do? I'll pray with my spirit, and I will also pray with my understanding. Look at this. I will sing with my spirit. I'll also sing with my understanding. There are times in your private prayer and your devotion or when we're corporately worshiping. Come on. Sometimes your worship for God reaches a place where you can't tell him how great he is where you run out of words to describe the glory of God. And the Holy Spirit says, let me help you worship. 
beyond your capacity. Let me sing through you in a way that you can't even frame or put together. Let me write a song in your spirit that goes greater than every verse that's ever been penned by the greatest songwriters that have ever done there's a worship that's greater than how great thou art wow there's a worship that's greater than shout to the Lord there's a worship that's greater than every hymn and every chorus. there's a worship that the Spirit of God releases through us and we sing in the Spirit and the angels have to join us praising God come on anybody interested in worshiping and praying and singing like that my goodness I, I'm, I'm running out of time so 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 I need to hurry come on um, let me just give you these verses. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, the Bible says, He that prays in a tongue is speaking to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, He that prays in a tongue edifies himself. Every time you pray in the Spirit, you pray in tongues, spiritually you're built up, built up, built up. How many need to be built up in the Spirit in this time? He says you're building in the Spirit. Look at this. This is in the Amplified. I want you to see it. In the little one chapter book of Job, Jude, excuse me, verse 20. Jude, verse 20. Only one chapter. Look at this in the Amplified. You got to watch this. It's on the big screens. Look. But you, beloved, Look at this. Build yourselves up. Found it on your most holy faith. Look at this. Make progress. Rise like an edifice. Higher and higher. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. My, 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 my. I want some of that. Read it again. Look at this. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Make progress. Rise like an edifice. Higher and higher. Praying in the Holy Spirit. My, 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 my. Come on, that's good stuff. So, so, so we see this happening for us. Uh, let, let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. I have this in the Amplified. While we're going to Romans 8, 26 and 27, something always neglected. You want to read Ephesians 5, 18. The final piece of armament in spiritual battle, Ephesians 5, 18 says, praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. When you put on the helmet of salvation, you've got the shield of faith, the belt of truth, your feet shod, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. He says, pray in the Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27 in the Amplified Translation. Let's look at this. So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. Anybody ever know you needed to pray but didn't know what to say? Anybody ever said, God, help me pray. I don't know what to pray, but God, I need something to happen. Okay, so what happens here? We don't know how we offer it. But the Spirit himself, my mind, goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groaning too deep for utterance. Did you see right there? We don't know how to pray, but there is a gift, a work, an opportunity. The Holy Spirit brings and prays through us and helps us pray. Uh, and, and, but then look at verse 27. This prayer is so powerful. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what's in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit, look at this, intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. Can I give you some good news? Every time you pray in tongues, every time you're praying in the Spirit, you may not know what you're praying. It's beyond your comprehension, but the good news is you are praying the perfect will of God. You are praying in line with the will of God. First John says, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. And I know if he hears me, I have the answer to my prayer. So when you're, when you got a baby in your womb, mama and daddy, and you're thinking about that baby's future, lay your hands on mama's tummy and pray in the spirit. And you are praying for the next year and the next year and the next year and their life and their career and their marriage. You're praying the will of God. Anybody hear what I'm saying? When you get ready to send those kids off to school in the morning, somebody ought to be praying in the spirit that the will of God will happen in their life. If you're trying to make a decision about a job move, you need to get along with God and pray in the spirit and say, I don't know which way to go, but you know which way to go. God lead me. God guide me. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Do you see 
why in the early church this common, blessed manifestation touched every part of their life. It was a gift of God. It brought strength. It was amazing. Let me take you to one final scripture. I've been wanting to get here because the parallel is amazing. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Come on, last scripture. I know I've I've just given you a lot of scripture today, but there's so much misinformation. I wanted to base everything I said on the word of God. 1 Samuel chapter 1. How many are finding that? Two crickets and three holy grunts. How many find it? First Samuel chapter one. Come on, let me hear you. All right. What about online? I heard you. Come on, let's get this. You ready? I want you to see this. Look at everything we've learned. What a parallel here. What a powerful parallel. All right. You know the account. First Samuel. Samuel became such a mighty prophet in Israel. That the Bible says, listen to this, listen to this. It doesn't say this about any other prophet. Not one word from his mouth fell to the ground. Everything he said, God made it come to pass. Wow. Here's the thing you need to know. Samuel was born when the priesthood was at the lowest point it had ever been. Eli, the high priest, had two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were blaspheming the temple, just desecrating the things of God. Eli had grown old and heavy and indifferent and given up. And the ministry was a mockery. And the Spirit of God had departed from that place. And God reaches over outside the human genealogy of priesthood. Are you with me? God reached over man's guidelines and restrictions and confinement and he found a little boy. But how did that happen? I want you to see the parallel. You see, his mother Hannah had been barren and she couldn't have a child. And every year her husband would take her to the temple to worship and sacrifice. Now, there was a problem because her husband had two wives. Now, I could stop right there. I don't have to say anything else. That's a knucklehead. He's a knucklehead. You, anyway, I didn't, I didn't have time for that today. It's too far in the sermon. All right, so, so the one wife had children. Hannah couldn't. The Bible uses a term, she became her rival. Can you imagine? You talk about dysfunction in, in that home tension. This one wife's bearing children. Hannah desperately wants to have a child. She can't do it. What are we going to do? This thing's bad. See, here's this barren woman. Here's a nation barren of the presence of God. Here's here's a moment of hopelessness. And she goes to the temple. And and they had already prayed and gone back to eat and have their, their, their meal, the celebration. But something was going on in Hannah. Are you with me right now? Something that said, I've already done what I had to do, but now I'm going to do what I need to do. Something was going on here. Something was happening here. And, and, and we drop down and we begin to look. Oh, uh, let, let's see. Uh, where do we want to start? Let's drop down and... And, and, and let's go to verse 9, chapter 1. Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple, the tabernacle. Look at this. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept huh, much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery, remind me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give up, give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be on his head. Look at verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Watch this. Remember this? Something sound familiar here? Eli thought she was drunk. I'm thinking about Acts chapter 2. Come on, you with me? And said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who's deeply troubled. Mm. Sometimes I don't know how to pray. Sometimes what's going on on the inside of me, you're not going to get on the outside. 
Sometimes what the Holy Spirit's doing, the physical eye is not going to grasp. Sometimes the way I pray may amaze you and perplex you, but don't dismiss me because I'm in the presence of God right now. Anybody with me? Eli answered, all right, then she says, do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the Lord God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. See, there's going to come a time when we've exhausted everything else we can do where we have tried everything we can do and we're still coming up without an answer. And then that's where we get to the place where we've said, I've done the religious thing. I've gone through the festival. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And now I'm going to do what I need to do. And I'm going to get on my knees before Almighty God. And I'm going to grab hold until something happens. And there always may be some religious mindset that thinks your prayer is crazy that think what you're doing is not going to make any sense and to dismiss it as foolishness. But I'm going to tell you something. That woman birthed in the spirit that day an answer to a prayer that brought a boy named Samuel into existence that restored the anointing to the nation of Israel and brought a revival in a God-bankrupt nation. And I just happen to believe that if enough people of God... In 2020, in the coronavirus pandemic, in the midst of our nation so divided, if someone will say, if a church would start praying crazy prayers, if a church would start praying unbelievable prayers, in fact, how do you think Ephesians 3.20 is going to get answered? Ephesians 3.20 says, and God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, listen, listen, all you can do. Think or imagine according to his power within you. So how do I pray for what I can't think of? And how do I ask for what I can't imagine? (laughs) Through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, when I've prayed all I can think, And I've asked all I can imagine. And I get on my knees like Hannah before God. And then the Holy Spirit from heaven begins to flow through us. Come on. We become a vehicle for what God wants to do above asking, above imagining. The power of the Holy Spirit begins to release revival in America. Begins to release revival in our school. Begins to stir up an awakening. I'm here to tell you today, praying in tongues is not weird. It'll get you wired. I'm telling you today what was common has become uncommon. But I'm saying if America gets dry enough and the church gets dry enough and people get fed up and there might be a generation, a church, a people like Hannah who will begin to pray prayers so bold, so strong, so big that God says, I'm going to answer that prayer. I'm going to step in and do something on that. I want you to.